Well, welcome to the thesis of defense of Gaius Julian Augustus. So Gaius rotated in my lab in the fall of 2014, where he continued a bioinformatics project on copy number variation in tumor uh, genomes started by a previous rotation student. Actually, that student was Julia Chang. <laughs> Julia. Um, Gaius wanted to make bioinformatics his métier, and he was looking for labs where he could learn bioinformatics, uh, bioinformatic techniques. And my lab had a lot of uh, different types of genomic DNA, and you're going to be hearing about some of those, not all of them, um, today. So Gaius became the driving force behind many of these different bioinformatics analyses, and all of it was centered around cancer health disparities in colorectal cancer. So at the outset, uh, Gaius was interested in epigenetics, uh, particularly genome-wide patterns in uh, DNA methylation, and he was looking at the genetics, GIDP, as his academic home. So um, this was kind of uh, both ironic and prophetic. Um, at the time, we didn't have any DNA methylation data in the lab, but he ended up uh, um, studying DNA methylation towards the end of the uh, of the thesis, and um, I, I became the director of the genetics program. <laughs> so, um, you know, my punishment. Um, so, Gaius has made many important contributions to our understanding of DNA methylation in early onset colorectal cancer. So, something I have always admired about Gaius has been his willingness to learn new things. He really invested a lot of time and energy into um, learning from Denise Rowe statistical methods, and it's really uh, served him very well. Um, and I really miss that expertise. He, would all, he also dive into just about any bioinformatics analysis that came his way. Um, and uh, so he just had a, a real thirst for learning new things. Um, as a consequence of the curiosity and initiative, Gaius has been an author on um, two collaborative papers. And um, Gaius also picked up an epi epidemiologic project that makes important points about screening in the time of tumor development. And um, this, this was joined with a, it actually emerged from this review article on colorectal cancer in African Americans when we started looking at the SEER data. And so from that, he got interested in the epidemiology and this paper was uh, published. So um, Gaius's versatility is evident throughout his thesis work. He has coding chops, is a master of R, and use statistical tools to separate wheat from chaff. And uh, he can get new applications running uh, to crunch big data. Uh, he makes awesome figures, <laughs> as you will see. Uh, he sets up and designs websites and he's a creative illustrator. I'm probably missing half a dozen other things, but that's a pretty good list. So I also knew how to get funding awards for travel for the, from the university, from the Summer Institute for Statistical Genetics. He had a, um, a couple of AACR travel awards, and he was supported by the uh, Cancer Biology Training Grant. So, Dias, please come to the mic. Thank you very much, Nathan. Can everyone hear me? Yes, awesome. And as I always say, if you can't hear me, tell me now. Good. <laughs> All right. So I have to start with um, some housekeeping. Thank you again to everyone for being here. Um, I did want to say, I know not everyone here is from academia. I have several friends here uh, from outside, and I just want to let you know um, that typically we save questions for the end. So um, it's fine to ask questions. There are no stupid questions. I've probably asked the dumbest questions you can during my PhD. So feel free to ask questions, uh, but do save them for the end. Um, I also have some housekeeping as far as this is concerned. Uh, this was kind of a joke going into, uh, I don't know, my second year, and we decided uh, that we needed a logo and a cool name for our research group, and so we came up with instability and cancer and epigenetics, and I created this logo just kind of for fun, 
uh, and to celebrate my uh, graduation, hopefully. <laughs> I updated the logo and I think it looks beautiful. I've uh, gained a lot of skill both on the coding science side and on the artistic side. And so I decided that we needed an update. So there you are, that's my gift to the lab uh, <laughs> on my way out. And so I just wanna go through a little bit of my journey about getting here. You've heard a little bit from Nathan. Uh, I wouldn't have be here today if it weren't for my partner, Dion. Uh, this we are, we've been together for 16 years. Uh, we've been through a lot. Uh, and we have our two cats. Oh, I have a pointer on the computer I can use. Uh, and we have our two cats, Hikaru and Lost. Uh, and really, I, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have gotten into grad school. I wouldn't have been able to survive grad school if it wasn't for Dion. So thank you very much for that. But there's a, another part of the story that I think is really interesting, and that's that uh, when I decided to join Nathan's lab, yeah, I was really interested in learning bioinformatics. But something that really um, excited me was the health disparities con uh, concept and the fact that I could do something that was hopefully going to make a difference in some people's lives. Um, and it's interesting, the bulk of my project has dealt with African Americans and their susceptibility uh, for getting colorectal cancer. Um, but about, I don't know, two, three years uh, after I got into graduate school and started working, I actually found out that Dion's grandmother had had colon cancer. And not just once, she had had surgery four times uh, for colon cancer. And her first time, she was under 50, which is You'll, you'll hear this is the age where you're supposed to start screening and getting colonoscopy. So she's an early onset colon cancer survivor. And this is just to say that, um, that a lot of times things you're doing on, even if they're not exactly relevant, they can become relevant. And that even when you're working on whether it's basic science or application-based conceptual work or translational science, there's always ways that we're applying science to our lives. And I think that that's really important. And so again, I've been working with Nathan for a long time now, and I was really driven by the fact that there's this health disparity in African-Americans who get colorectal cancer. And just for those who don't know, the health disparity is just any difference that you see between multiple populations who contract a disease or who, get, who have differences in how that disease looks. And this is really the crux of that health disparity. So this is incidence data and mortality data for colorectal cancer, and it's divided into race where we have African Americans in purple and we have non Hispanic whites in green. And the main thing to see here is that the incidence and in mortality rates of African Americans are higher than they are in whites. And if we look at from this is 92 to 2014, which is the most recent data that we have, uh, the incidence data has been closing a bit. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's, pro that's happening. Um, but the mortality data, even though we've seen a little bit of decrease in the disparity and the difference between these two, it hasn't really been that dramatic. Um, in general, African Americans tend to be diagnosed younger. Um, they tend to um, have their cancers develop on the right side, and they're more likely to, once they are diagnosed, be di diagnosed at later stages. And there's a lot of reasons for that um, that are both access to healthcare um, as well as potentially biological things. But before I go into that too much, what I would like to do is step back and let's just talk about colorectal cancer as a whole. So colorectal cancer is um, the cancer of both the colon and the rectum, surprise. Um, and we divide it into those two levels, but we also divide it into two parts, the proximal and the distal part of the colon. And that's partially because of some differences in methodology as far as screening is concerned, because this turn is pretty hard to make. Uh, but it's also because we've actually seen some molecular differences that I won't be talking about, but are really interesting uh, between proximal and distal tumors. Colorectal cancer is one of the top most common um, cancers diagnosed in the US. Uh, and even though we've seen a dramatic uh, decrease in incidence, um, it still remains pretty high on the list. And if, the, and if caught early, colorectal cancer is rather easily cured. You take out the section of, uh, of the colon and stitch the rest together. And um, in a lot of cases, if caught early enough, that's enough. Um, but if it's let go into later stages, then it becomes a deadly disease. And the mortality goes from 
80, 90 percent uh, survival, survival to down to five to 10 percent survival, depending on where you're looking. So let's talk about how colorectal cancer develops. So colorectal cancer actually doesn't start out as a cancer. It starts as a benign polyp in the colon um, lumen. And at that point, it's called an adenoma or a polyp. And this is the best time to catch something that could grow into a colorectal cancer. Um, screening, especially colonoscopy, when they're going in and they're looking, these are what they hope to see. Because these are the things that, um, if left to grow, are going to break through the wall of the colon and become uh, adenocarcinoma, a cancer. And at this point, uh, it's still a localized cancer. It's probably like a stage one, and it hasn't gone any place. And so at this point, um, it's still easily treatable because it hasn't spread very far. Once it's led to grow further than that, it starts um, bringing in veins to help it get oxygen. It starts spreading um, cancer cells to nearby lymph nodes. And once it's allowed to do that, then we see metastasis where the primary tumor um, lets off some cells, those go someplace else, and typically the liver or the lung and create a metastasis. Um, at this point, we call this a distant colorectal cancer, and that would be a stage four unmetastasizing colorectal so these are the words that I'm going to be using for uh, the bulk of the talk, localized, regional, and distant. Uh, and it's typically believed that a, a cancer goes through these steps. And this process can take, takes a really long time. This is really well studied. And typically these are on the order of decades. We're talking 10, 20 or more years to develop this. So the way that screening works right now, at the age of 50, you would get your colonoscopy and you get rechecked in 10 years if you don't have an adenoma. If you have an adenoma, you get checked in five, uh, three to five years. Um, and that should be sufficient to catch colorectal cancer. So in, as far as improvements gone, we've seen a lot of improvements in screening since 2000. Uh, and one of the improvements is, it, is it's not related to techniques, it's just uptake. So we've seen a lot more uptake in colorectal cancer screening with going from much less than 40% to 60%. And 60% of the people who are screening uh, are using colonoscopy. And we've also seen a reduction in incidence, as I mentioned earlier. And this isn't just, I'm not just talking about African-Americans here, I'm talking about total. And at least partially, probably not di directly, but at least partially uh, screening has helped with that. Reduction in incidence. And again, screening is recommended to start at age 50. Uh, but if you look at the under 50 group, we have seen actually an increase in incidence. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about trends we see in early onset, but this is of active importance for us to look at. And what this suggests is that there's a, some environmental lifestyle changes that have been occurring over time. And this is driving incidence up in everyone, uh, but that screening at least in part, is helping to decrease that incidence. So just looking at this in a more visual standpoint, most of us uh, are disease-free. We do not have colorectal cancer, um, but some people do develop adenomas that are benign and can be removed um, quite easily. Then once they become uh, a cancer, we call them localized, and as they grow bigger, they become regional, and distant colorectal cancers have spread to other parts of the body, most often the liver. And so as progression is driving our incidence of colorectal cancer up, we also have screening and the screening effect, which should be driving our incidence back toward an earlier stage. So what this means is what we should be seeing is less and less distant cancers and more localized or adenoma cancers because we're doing better with screening, and so we should be catching things earlier. So um, as I was working on this review that, that Nathan talked about, um, I asked, I was looking at the incidence levels a lot, looking at it by race, and kind of just digging into the data to make sure I believed what all the papers said. Um, and I asked the question, okay, well, if we look by stage, what do we see? Uh, do we see everything going down at the same rate? And we don't. Actually, what we see is that while localized and regional cancers have been going down, again, we're looking from 2000, 2014, and we're looking at incidence rates on the y-axis. As we've seen, and localized is in green, regional in yellow, and distant is in red, 
because it's the most great. So uh, we've seen 28 to 34% reductions in early onset colorectal cancer, which is quite profound. I, I think that's really important. But then if you look at distant colorectal cancers, which we should be preventing more of, we've only had a 12% reduction. Uh, and not only did I not believe this result, I pretty much went to everyone and said, tell me how I did the stats wrong and tell me how I did my R code wrong. Uh, but it's also kind of counterintuitive. Um, but one of the things that I thought initially was, okay, well, maybe this is just representative of a small pop of a population of patients that aren't screening. And therefore, we're seeing that those are all the distant cancers. And so the first thing that I looked at was age. Again, we know that people under 50 are largely not screening. And so um, I decided to look at age. But what I want to show, what I want to point your attention to here, this is the same plot as before, but instead we're showing early people under 50, people 50 to 64, and people over 65. And we still see a difference. We still see this shallower rate of reduction in the distant cancer than we see in these sharp slopes of the earlier stage cancers. And in, but in early, I do want to just mention that all of these are going up. Remember, I told you incidence is going up in early onset. Uh, the distant is going up more steeply. Now we know that um, early onset is more likely to show up in distant. Uh, and again, that's large, that could be largely related to the fact they're not screening. So um, they're not maybe not symptomatic until that point. But um, to me, this is, looks like the same trend. Distant is going up faster in early, it's going down slower uh, in the later stage. And because I work on health disparities by race, I decided to also look um, by race. And we see this everywhere. So the first thing I looked at was African Americans. But then when I looked at whites, when I looked at Asian and Native American populations, we saw the same thing. Um, you're looking at the same graph with Native American, Asian or Pacific Islander, Black or African American and white um, data. And again, in all of these, the red line is shallower than the earlier onset. Uh, I'm sorry, than the earlier stage disease. And so if we think about this from a point, standpoint of screening, when we see no screening, we see that it's increasing faster, it being the distant colorectal cancer compared with the earlier stage cancer. But despite the screening rates in uh, the middle and late in our Native American and Asian population or black or white, we're still seeing the shallower uh, or less reduction in colorectal cancer. And so we started thinking about how this could be and we went through a lot of different hypotheses that I don't have time to talk about. But in general, it all comes back to looking at interval cancer. So interval cancers are the cancers that you get between screenings. And I wanna direct your attention to this black line right here. So what you're looking at is time along the X axis and cancer progression along the Y. At some point, uh, a adenoma will develop, grow into a cancer, and at some point that disease is um, cancer, but it's not yet detectable um, by screening methods. If it's allowed to, and at this point we have a uh, screening occurring. Now if we keep allowing it to grow and it grows fast enough, it can actually become metastatic and incurable before the next screening. And this is the set of data that I think that we're looking at here. And so to us, this means instead of looking at colorectal cancers that are taking 10, 20 years to develop, we're actually looking at a form of colorectal cancer that grows more rapidly. Now, this isn't necessarily a new idea. We actually know that there are some hereditary forms of colorectal cancer that uh, grow um, more rapidly. We also know of another sporadic, which means it's not hereditary, form of cancer called MSI, a microsatellite instability. Um, and tumors that have MSI are more likely to grow rapidly. There's some evidence to show that. But these cancers are more likely to occur in the proximal colon. They're more likely to uh, occur in, in females. And when we looked at proximal versus distal, you're looking at the same plots, but this is proximal tumor. Um, proximal tumors and distal tumors, we saw no real, um, real difference. If anything, the distal um, tumors, not to be confused with distant, uh, the distant tumors and the distal tumors uh, are, uh, there's a bigger difference there between the early and the late stage disease. We also looked in female and male, saw no, no difference there. 
And when we look at the stage distributions and just compare them to what we know about MSI tumors, they're not really the same either. So this led us to the hypothesis that this is a, um, a novel subtype of colorectal cancer that we don't know about yet that is advancing rapidly and therefore it's evading screening. And just looking at the data, our hypothesis uh, or our prediction that we would make is that um, this is predominantly the case in early onset tumors. And there's a lot of evidence talking about uh, the fact that early onset tumors may be different from uh, tumors that occur later in life, but I'm not gonna talk about it today. Uh, so that's all I have on that story. And I just wanna remind you of everything that I said that's relevant to as we go. So I told you late stage colorectal cancer has um, had much less of a reduction in incidence in earlier stages, and this is enriched in uh, early onset. But I also told you back at the beginning that African Americans are more likely to be diagnosed earlier and they have much greater risk of colorectal cancer in general. So moving forward, I wanna talk a little bit about how we think about disease and how I thought about disease when I was looking at my projects and trying to figure out altogether what they meant. So we know that genetics can increase your risk of disease, right? Uh, in colorectal cancer, there is a gene called APC, which is this initiator of cancer. When you get a mutation in APC, uh, you get downstream genomic instability, and that can lead to, uh, to cancer. Uh, and, but we also know that there you can have um, a hereditary form where that APC gene is already mutated, and that can give you a higher risk colorectal cancer. We also know that environment can cause cancer. You go out in the sun, you get sunburned too many times, you may end up with a skin cancer, right? Um, and we also know that there are interactions, that these things are not uh, islands in and of themselves. I mean, you, and we know such as um, people that are carriers for sickle cell um, can also be resistant to malaria. And so that's a genetic thing that people have but it also has a relationship with disease and how likely someone is to get disease. Now, one of the problems or challenges, I should say, with getting environmental data is that it is a moving target. Uh, environmental data is hard to quantify, it's hard to pin down, and it's always changing. And so, and the definitions are, are often uh, moving around. So even though we try to capture environmental data, uh, it's not the easiest thing to do. So this was just my kind of mindset when trying to just think about this as a whole, um, as a whole project all in one thing, spending five years of my life on it, right? And so when thinking about African-American um, colorectal cancer, um, I was happy to be able to use data from the Chicago Colorectal Cancer Consortium. So this was a consortium that was founded um, in Chicago and Xavier Yor, uh, Rosa Shikola, and whoever this guy is, um, all work together to collect a vast amount of data on perspective um, and retrospective data for, from colon cancers, from African Americans, from whites, and from uh, some controls as well. And they had the great, in, the great uh, insight uh, to go and get a lot of different genomic data on this series. Now there's something really, really uh, unique about this data set that is not in any other data set that I know of uh, that studies um, colorectal cancer health disparities in African Americans. And that's that this study was done in an urban low income area. So to me, what that means is that this is more applicable to the people who are really at risk for colorectal cancer. Um, so I worked on a lot of projects and I'm gonna talk to you about a few of them, but we were able um, but they, they had, again, had the foresight to get microbiome data, to look at uh, exome, to pick out variants and mutations, get DNA methylation analysis, which I didn't find out until later, um, to do a copy number, and to get metabolomics, which I won't be talking about today. And there are a few other things that I didn't put on here that I won't be talking about. But this is just to show you the vast amounts of data that not only did they collect, but that I was like, can I try it? Let me just see if... I can find something. Uh, and so I had a lot of fun being able to try and figure out different things. And I did specifically ask, like, I just want to touch as many different types of data as possible, get my hands on it so that I can just become as well-rounded as possible. So thinking about African-American colorectal cancer, there's two different kind of arms that I've been thinking about. 
And the first is susceptibility to cancer. This is talking about risk, right? This is how likely is it for someone to get colorectal cancer and what are the factors involved with that? And the other is once you have the cancer, um, how does it develop? And what does the, the development look like and how might that be different from what we know and have studied? So let me just start with susceptibility. And for this, I'm gonna talk about our microbiome study. So this was a study where um, we got information about the bacteria that actually live in the gut. Um, so this was actually colon samples collected from African Americans from the CCCC, as well as non-Hispanic whites. And we were able to get cases and controls. So cases are people who have colorectal cancer and controls are people who do not have colorectal cancer. Uh, so we got several data types. Uh, one is quantitative data on actually how much of certain bacteria uh, there are in the gut. One was uh, six genetic sequencing data, which actually tells us a lot about biodiversity uh, and how that biodiversity can be different in different places. I'm not gonna be talking about that today, even though again, super interesting. Um, and then we also got some self-reported dietary data. This was a survey um, that was given out to some of our participants so that we could try to measure some exposure uh, or environmental type data. Now the goal of this study was actually, actually came out of uh, studies on this little um, bug. This is Bolafla wadsworthia. And what's interesting about Bolafla wadsworthia and other sulfatogenic bacteria is that they produce this molecule called hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide has been seen uh, to be uh, more abundant in patients that have colitis, and patients who have colitis uh, are more likely to develop colorectal cancer, they have heightened risk. And so the idea is, does the abundance of Bolafala wadsworthia and other sulfatogenic bacteria tell us anything about um, uh, risk for colorectal cancer? So, um, this is data for, this is that RTQ, uh, that qPCR data. And what we're looking at here is the abundance uh, or a marker for abundance of, um, of DNA, which is a marker or a, a substitute kind of for how much of that bacteria is in, there, in the gut of these particular patients. And each dot here represents one patient. So we have African-Americans and we have non-Hispanic whites. And at the bottom, you'll see those are um, separated into cases controls for African-Americans, cases and controls for whites. And the two things that we're looking at here is, this is pan DSRA, that's what I'll be calling it. And this is just more of a general marker for sulfatogenic bacteria, it includes a lot of species. Uh, and then specifically the one that um, the primary, the principal researcher was interested in, which is Bolafla Wadsworthia, yeah, which I showed you in the last slide. Now I hope that it's rather easy to see that African-Americans have a heightened amount uh, both of these in their gut compared to whites. But this actually, I think it's really interesting when you look at the data from by uh, case and control. And what we saw was that African-American cases have significantly more of Bolafla wadsworthia than in controls. And this is different than all the other sulfatogenic bacteria that had more in controls. Um, but this really points out Bolafla wadsworthia's potential role um, and the next question that we wanted to ask was, hey, we have some dietary data. Is this related at all to what people are eating? And what we found there, this is a big table, and I apologize, but this is all the dietary information we were able to um, extract from the questionnaire. Uh, and the things that I want to focus your attention on are the fact that if we look at the protein and the fat, they're higher in African Americans than they are in white. And it's known that, um, that cohorts that have more, that eat more red meat and more processed meat uh, have a heightened colorectal cancer incidence. So this goes along with the fact that we know African Americans have heightened risk. We know that people who eat red meat and processed meat have heightened risk. And so it wasn't necessarily surprising. It was actually really good news, in a bad, weird sort of way that African Americans had heightened um, intake of protein and fat. And so what I decided to do was uh, ask the question, does the diet explain the abundance of uh, the microbes that I showed you before? Because if there was a direct relationship and nothing else was involved, then we could really talk about interventions and go move forward thinking through uh, how that might be occurring. 
So this is a plot that represents statistical models. And I decided not to bore you with statistical model tables like the last uh, table that I showed you and instead show you something that hopefully will make a little bit more sense. So each of these is a representation of one model, one for the abundance of PANDSRA and one for the abundance of Balafala Wadsworthian. And over here on the left are just the different variables that I put in. And the idea is just that if we look at any one by itself, um, we have adjusted or tried to correct the model for the other things within it. And the main thing that I, and the way that this works is there's a center line, I mean, it's not always center, but this one line here, um, and this is the, like the null. So this means if the dot is on that line, it means that there's no relationship. The further to the right that the line goes in blue, the stronger a relationship is in the positive direction. Uh, and the more that it goes into the red, the more a negative association. So as the abundance goes up, this goes down. And the most curious thing in this whole thing, it was that African-American race, even after we adjusted for other covariates, was still the main effector. Uh, the main thing that, that pre predicts the abundance of these bacteria. So after correcting for diet. So does this mean that race defines how much bacteria you have? Uh, no, and what it means is that there's some kind of other variable that's very, very highly correlated with race that we don't know yet um, and that we need to figure out that is highly uh, associated with these abundances. And that's hopefully where the future directions of this project. So I've told you so far, late stage colorectal cancer, goes down, is going down more slowly than earlier stage disease. I've connected that to African Americans who are more at risk for early onset and have a greater risk of colorectal cancer. I've, I've told you that at least in our cohort, Af the African Americans had a diet that was enriched in protein and fat, which we know are um, associated with colorectal cancer risk, but that after we corrected for diet, uh, our African Americans still had a greater abundance of the sulfogenic protein. So I'm gonna move on from here and move on to looking at the tumor genesis where the bulk of my work uh, happened. And again, for this, we're looking at how the actual colorectal cancers develop as they start growing. And I have to introduce you to another data set, which is the Cancer Genome Atlas. Now in 2012, the Cancer Genome Atlas came out with a study called the Comprehensive Molecular Characterization of Human Colon and Rectal Cancer. And what they did was did a nice big study with lots of participants and they did a comprehensive look at all sorts of genomic things that I showed you that the CCC did. Um, but unfortunately, something that they didn't do very well was include diverse populations. So most of the data within that data set, despite the fact that um, there are several minority groups that really needed to be looked at because of heightened risk, most of their uh, participants were white, and the, you, the places where they collected data from were most often in well-to-do places. I think they all were. So there's some limitations to using this data, but it's been used in lots of studies, and so we know how robust it is. So it, we use it as um, a data set that we could use as a comparison group. So this comprehensive study that we did um, included CCCC African Americans, uh, so those are the ones we collected, um, and we compared those in these studies to the TCGA non-Hispanic whites. And I was able to look at copy number. So when tumors develop, uh, sometimes whole chromosome or chromosome arms get lost. Sometimes whole chromosome, chromosome arms get gained. Um, and we can actually look at that genomic data and see what's happening in these tumors. We also collected exome data. So this allows us to look at individual base pairs uh, in the genome and see if they've been mutated and if they've been mutated in genes that are important, that we know are important for um, cancer development. And then also surprisingly, I got to look at DNA methylation data. Um, so DNA methylation can have a role in whether genes are expressed or not uh, and in regulating genes. And so give, looking at genome-wide methylation data could give us some insight into um, whether there are patterns that are different in gene regulation. So let's just start with the copy number analysis because I love to start with negative results. 
Uh, so this is uh, actually a very interesting negative result. What you're looking at here are copy number changes across the genome. So over here is chromosome one, chromosome two, and each one of these lines is a break. And we go all the way to chromosome 22. If you can. Uh, and the top that you're looking at are the CCCC African-Americans and the bottom are TCGA. So there are some small, oh, and the going up from the center line is the more percentage of patients who had an alteration at that point, where up is a chromosome gain and red is a chromosome loss. And so looking across this, um, what I hope is rather obvious uh, and statistically was very obvious is that um, there's not really much difference. There are some small differences here and there, but nothing that's significant, nothing that stood out to us as being, aha, there we go. And so what this really shows us is that um, the copy number um, profile of whites and blacks uh, is pretty much the same as far as our colorectal cancer cohorts are concerned. So next, uh, I told you we looked at mutation data. And again, we're looking here at uh, single nucleotide changes, right? So we're looking at one letter of the genome changing. And we know uh, from previous work that certain uh, mutations occur more often in colorectal cancer. And what you're seeing here is what's called a waterfall plot. And each column of this plot represents one patient. So this patient, this series at the top here is representative of the CCCC African-American cohort that we did. Uh, and just hold on a second about this one. So the main one that I want to draw your attention to is this first line here. And what we saw that was one of the most more interesting things that we saw in this data set was that African-Americans in our cohort had only 60% of them had mutations in APC. Again, APC is this initiator gene that we know is found very often in colorectal cancer. And actually, this is data from TCGA. And this first bar is the percent of patients that have APC mutations. And they found 80% having mutations. And other data sets have that same area, 80%. But we found 60% in our cohort, which was very odd. Um, and we wanted to understand why. And so we looked to see if there was anything that kind of correlated or was associated with that, um, that observation. And so the first thing that we saw was um, that there was an age difference. So this uh, row right here is the age of the patients where orange is under the median age of 57 for our um, cohort and blue or cyan is greater than 57 for our cohort. And this group over here that don't have APC mutations, there's a lot more orange, and this is statistically validated, that, are, that patients that do not have this APC mutation tend to be younger. So we went back to the copy number data, and ignore this, I apologize, I was supposed to take this out. Um, but this is all, uh, this is looking at our African-American data, and in this case we are, um, we're separating patients who did not have an APC mutation and patients that they'd have an APC mutation. And in this case, we saw an interesting trend. We saw that even though there were no differences in our African-American and white cohorts, we did see differences in copy number. So I'll just point out a couple, um, chromosome eight here in the red, chromosome seven in the blue, um, and chromosome 18 in the red. We saw significant differences in the number of um, alterations that were occurring. And re the resulting um, interpretation was that patients that do not have APC mutations are also more chromosomally stable, which means they have less of these things happening. Um, so trying to understand this a little bit more, we're saying, okay, these patients don't have APC mutations, which we know initiate most colorectal cancer. Um, they are younger in age and they have fewer alterations. So what else could be going on? And so luckily, uh, there was a small group of patients who had right-sided colorectal cancer and that were um, covered in our exome study. But we also had DNA methylation data. And so we thought, well, let's look at the DNA methylation data and see if we can see anything interesting there. 
So this is called a heat map, and this is uh, D called a differential methylation analysis. And at the top, what you're looking at um, are each patient, where the red um, are patients that had an APC mutation, the pink are patients that did not have an APC mutation, and the green are normal tissue for us to compare to. And on the side, what you're looking at, each of these little lines represents some area, some region of the genome that's been picked out. And this isn't the entire genome, this is just the most variable. So these are the places where we most are interested in seeing whether there are differences in our cohorts. And these graphs that are on the top and side, mostly I want to show you the top, um, represent uh, how similar or dissimilar samples are. And so what this algorithm tries to do is it looks at samples and it creates some kind of distant measurement between them that says these samples are more similar to each other and these samples are, a lot, are more different from each other. And then it tries to kind of order those, the most similar and the most different. So what we saw here, um, and just so you know, the red is more methylation than we expect, or than we see in, um, in the app on average, and the blue is um, less methylation than we expect. Um, so what we saw here that was of interest is that we see clustering of the patients without APC mutations with normal samples, meaning they have less, uh, they are more like normal than the patients that have APC mutations. This data on the left is the CCCC, and we did this in 11 samples. Uh, and so we decided, okay, well, TCGA also has DNA methylation data. Let's look over there and see if we see a similar trend. And we did. If we look at this portion of the patient data, we also saw that the uh, patients that did not have APC mutations clustered with the normal and tended to have less uh, methylation, uh, different, differential methylation going on. And the APC mutation positive tumors tended to cluster uh, on their own. So then the next thing that we want to do is say, okay, well, is there something special about those locations? There's a lot of data here that needs to be uh, gone through. Uh, so I don't have really a lot of further information to tell you about these, this signature, but what I will say is there are a lot of interesting clues here and then we have found a couple of, of genes that uh, our interest of, of interest for us to look on uh, later on. And I also want to mention that we do know that um, there is a DNA methylation signature that we know of in colorectal cancer. It's called SIM. Um, and I just want to tell anyone who knows about that, that this, we specifically looked at SIM with this and that all of these patients were non-SIM. So they did not have that signature. So these are not SIM signatures. So we looked to see where these methylation, where this methylation was occurring. So on the left, we have samples that had an APC mutation. On the right, samples that did not have that APC mutation. And what you're looking at here is just the number of, um, of regions, those differentially methylated regions, and they're split into two groups, hypermethylated, which is that overmethylation, and hypomethylation, which is that undermethylation. And then each color here represents a type of area in the genome. So is it inside the gene? Is it in the part of the gene that regulates the gene? Um, that sort of thing. So the first thing I want to point out here is that these look like they're just flipped, but uh, the axes are actually very different scales. Over here, the top number is 30,000, and over here, the top number is 6,000. What that means is that there's a lot less differential methylation hurt, uh, happening in the patients that did not have an APC mutation. But what's interesting is that unlike the hypermethylation group with, uh, in the patients that had a mutation, patients that did not have that mutation had this enrichment for enhancer regions. So enhancer regions are just these regions that get bound to, and they can actually help to um, uh, in the promotion of uh, and regulating and promoting uh, transcription of genes. So there's this interesting, uh, and unfortunately I don't have much more, I don't have any more information than this enrichment for enhancer regions um, that is pretty exciting and that we need to look more into. So I've talked about a lot of different projects, so I'm just going to run through what you heard today. I told you late stage uh, colorectal cancer has been being reduced in incidence at a much slower rate than, more, than less advanced. 
uh, colorectal cancer and that that's that was enriched uh, in the early onset uh, group. And then I told you that African Americans are greater at risk for colorectal cancer diagnosis, but they're also at, more at risk for being diagnosed below the age of 50. Uh, I went on to, to show you that in our cohort, the diet of African Americans was significantly different uh, than whites, and it was enriched for protein uh, and fat, but that independent of diet, or at least after correcting for diet, the African Americans had greater abundances of sulfonogenic bacteria, and of major interest is Balafala Wadsworthia that were made in more abundance uh, in cases and controls. And I changed uh, direct, I changed topics a little bit and we talked about the actual uh, mutation landscape of colorectal cancers in African Americans. And we saw that African Americans have fewer APC mutations. And then I showed you that those APC mutations are associated with younger age of onset, so lack of, lack of APC mutation is associated with younger age of onset, more chromosome stability, and this unique methylation signature that seems to be enriched for in enhancer regions. So let's go back a minute to an early slide and talk about how this all fits together. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, environment, we know that environment can cause cancer. We know that genetics can cause cancer. And we know that there's interactions that can happen that can uh, change susceptibility for disease. But we really haven't dug well enough, I think, into the interactions part of that. And it's not surprising that we haven't because it's very difficult to measure those intera interactions. And so really my thought is that those interactions, the best that we can do is to look at intermediate steps. So the microbiome data that I showed you, the bacteria in the gut, looking at metabolomics data, how things are metabolized uh, in the gut. Those are intermediate things that hopefully can give us some information about those interactions that are happening. And as far as future directions is concerned, what I think we really need are studies that have larger sample, sample sizes so that we can pick out um, things in more people. Uh, the more sample size we have, the more we can pick out smaller differences. We need uh, studies that have more comprehensive environmental data. The TCGA, one of the pitfalls of TCGA, besides what I already mentioned, is that they didn't want to get some of that, a lot of that environmental data. Uh, and so we missed out on a really great opportunity to look at that because they decided that they didn't want to have to deal with that. And we also need much, much better inclusion of patients from diverse backgrounds. Uh, the TCGA, as I mentioned, was mostly um, upper middle class, um, hospitals that serve upper middle class regions. It was mostly white. Uh, and while that study gives a lot of interesting information, what our studies show is that it's not good enough to help patients who are at higher risk of colorectal cancer. And this is not just true in colorectal cancer, this is true in cancer across the board. So with that, I would like to thank uh, everyone who has supported me. There are so many different people um, that have just been so helpful for help from helping me choose a lab to once I joined the lab, helping me figure out uh, how to navigate the system, um, as well as all the developers who helped. So I started coding in R when I joined the lab, and I was back and forth with a lot of different developers about how to use their software and how to make optimizations. And I was very lucky that the R um, community is just very willing to make that effort and, and make things work. And especially a big thank you to the Tidyverse package, which once I started using that, was just like so amazing. So I also want to thank uh, my lab group. So these are the people that I have been hanging out with for five years and the people that have been there uh, to support me to make sure that I could practice for my comp exams, that I could tell when uh, things weren't quite going so well and I was frustrated and when the power went out and I didn't have a computer to work on gave me a place to go and just chill until the power came back on. Uh, and I want to give a, a special shout out to Nathan. Uh, his office was always open to me um, and if he wasn't available he was always ready to schedule a time when he would be available but most of the time he was available. Um, even when he was busy he would take time out to answer my questions uh, when he was on uh, vacation, he was available to answer my questions. Um, but he also gave me freedom to be independent. Uh, there were lots of weeks where I just 
didn't talk to him. Uh, and I just kind of did things on my own and tried to figure things out. And he let me do that. And then when I came back, he still was willing to help. me. So I appreciate that. Um, the other person I really, really want to thank is Mary Eagle. Um, so Mary um, really stepped up to the plate, especially, I mean, Mary's amazing. That's our lab manager and organizes everything. Um, but uh, over the past year or so, I've been having uh, increasing uh, health problems. And Mary really uh, stepped up to the plate to help me get the last bit of wet lab data that I needed um, to really finish up this work. So thank you, Mary. I really appreciate it. And I have to do an in memoriam because I've had a lot of hair colors <laughs> the whole time that I've been in grad school. And I was actually very excited to have that freedom and have the money to be able to afford uh, to have my hair done and buy dyes. Um, but unfortunately, I cut that off because I have no idea where I'm going. And so I figured just in case, I should probably just go ahead and have my natural hair color. So um, I, I'm sorry that I had to leave you behind. <laughs> And thank you for serving me well and being beautiful. <laughs> and then one more slide um, that I want to just thank my community outside of UA. Um, I've already talked about Dion and Dion, I mean, you've been fantastic and so supportive of me even on in the worst days. Um, but also the other person that I just really, really want to send a shout out to is Sone. Uh, Sone, we went to uh, undergrad together and uh, then they followed us out here in Tucson, and we are the only reason they came out here. <laughs> um, but Sony is one of those people who, no matter how bad things are, you can go talk to them and they will make you smile. And so it's just been such a joy um, to have Sony in Tucson uh, with us, and I really appreciate having you around. In addition to that, I've been in a lot of communities that have just been totally separate from the university, uh, the queer and trans community in town, um, the fashion groups that I'm in and the artists that have uh, let me hang out with them, even though nowadays I tend to be more of a scientist than an artist, even though I've been picking back up on the art side of things. Uh, and I also have to do a huge shout out to my Twitter community because I, in the last year got, or year and a half, got really into Twitter. Um, and especially, um, I want to send a shout out to Chris Cloney. Uh, who leads the Grad Blogger Connect community. Uh, he was one of those people who went out of his way to um, talk to me and uh, ask me um, how I was doing and ask me uh, what, he, what, he, we, what I needed from him in order to succeed. But also the, SciCom, the science communication, science art communities have been really helpful. So with that, I will shut up, but not really because I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you.